Number 1. Alice Snuffleupagus, performed by Judy Slatke. In the show's third season, Big Bird first met Aloysius Snuffleupagus, aka Snuffy. He and Big Bird quickly became best friends, but due to Snuffy's chronic shyness and a series of unfortunate coincidences, the large creature would always be just out of sight when the adults were around, leading to the bulk of the cast to believe that Snuffy was just Big Bird's imaginary friend. All the way in Season 17, Snuffy was finally revealed to everyone, and officially welcomed to Sesame Street. With Snuffy's reveal, the world of the Snuffleupaguses opened up. We learned about their history, they were given Cultural Appreciation Day, we explored their vast caves, and they were even the stars of a theatrical film the gang saw called Honey, I Shrunk the Snuffleupagus. We also got to meet Snuffy's mother and his little sister Alice. First and foremost, Alice is cute. There's no two ways about it, she is absolutely adorable. At two years old, she's still learning a lot about the world around her, often repeating phrases she hears others say. Snuffy does his best to be a good brother to her, teaching her all he knows. Well, Snuffy, it's important to play with your sister, you know. It is? Why? Well, because uh, she needs to learn all the things that you know how to do, and, well, you're her brother, and she loves you. <laughs> like all two-year-olds, Alice has a difficult side and can be something of a handful, which is amplified by her size. When she throws tantrums and stomps around, she causes tremors. When she attempts to master the art of blowing through her snuffle, she makes many hurricanes. In a way, she's a reminder of the raw power possessed by the average snuffleupagus. We're lucky they're such a kind and gentle species. I was surprised when I started writing this that Alice hasn't been on the show for a while, which is of course why she's on this list. The last episode she appeared in was filmed in 2000. She appeared on the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade float until 2008, however, so maybe that's where I got confused. I can't find a reason as to why she stopped appearing, but if I had to make a guess, it could be that her performer, Judy Sladke, wanted to retire the character for one reason or another, especially since Alice was her only role on the show. Whatever the reason, there's still a nice amount of Alice footage out there for fans. She is a delight to watch, and I'll say it one more time, she is really, really cute. Number 2. Baby Tooth and the Fuzzy Funk, typically performed by Joey Mazzarino, Kevin Clash, and David Rudman. This trio was often seen throughout the 90s in a series of highly entertaining inserts. Often they would demonstrate different cultural dances, sometimes with a real human joining them but other times they simply existed to encourage kids to jump up and dance with them. Their dances didn't always go smoothly, but the monsters never let that set them back for too long. The segments appeared in episodes from 1992 to 1997, making them a regular part of my own childhood Sesame Street viewing experience. Each segment was usually broken up into three parts that would play at different intervals throughout the show. While they were fine for me as a kid, I think I enjoy these ones more as an adult. That is some seriously great puppeteering. Number 3. The Beautiful Day Monster when Sesame Street entered production, a lot of puppets featured were leftovers from previous Henson productions, most likely for budgetary reasons. Even Ralph the Dog made a cameo in one episode. One leftover Muppet was built for an unaired snack commercial, and made his public debut on The Ed Sullivan Show. In that sketch, the monster continuously tried to ruin a girl's beautiful day, thus earning his name. Throughout Sesame Street Season 1, the monster antagonized Ernie, Bert, and Kermit. He was rebuilt early on, receiving bigger eyes and a slightly friendlier appearance. He never really received a consistent personality or performer, being performed at different times by Jim Henson, Frank Oz, and Carol Spinney. By season two, he was replaced by cuter-looking monsters, and eventually was rebuilt again, joining the cast of The Muppet Show, and still occasionally showing up as a background player in productions today. However, his Sesame Street career remains firmly in the past. Oh, and remember that unaired commercial I mentioned? Another monster was created for that. You know him today as Cookie Monster. Number 4. Benny Rabbit, performed by Kevin Clash. When it comes to negativity, Benny easily takes the cake. Oscar the Grouch is known and loved for being, well, grouchy, but Benny is often downright angry. In all fairness, he's usually mad about something that could drive anyone up the wall. But underneath his anger lies a secretly sensitive individual, as we will soon see. Benny was introduced in 1991 as a cranky rabbit who liked to keep to himself, Usually, he was attempting to go downtown, but also had a nicer side to him that occasionally surfaced, especially when it came to helping kids. His real moment to shine came in 1993, when the Sesame Street gang faced some ratings competition from a certain purple dinosaur. 
1993 Season 25 introduced a new set called Around the Corner, which expanded the street to include new areas and characters. As I said earlier, I was born in 1990, so this was prime Sesame Street viewing time for me. I remember a lot of these locations fondly. Selena's Dance Studio, Gina's Daycare, Ruthie's Antique Shop, and, of course, the Furry Arms Hotel. It was there that Benny became a bellhop, working for the ditzy Sherry Netherland alongside the equally ditzy Humphrey and Ingrid. Poor Benny never seemed to be able to catch a break. With a character like Oscar, his irate nature stemmed from his species. He's a grouch who are naturally ill-tempered and hate cheeriness. Thus, the friendly inhabitants of Sesame Street were bound to get on his nerves. With Benny, though, it really did feel like the fates were often against him, especially at his hectic job. As mentioned, Benny did have a nicer side as well. While he often hated to be touched, snapping, Don't touch me! to anyone who tried to touch him or looked like they might even be considering trying to touch him, he also seemed to be aware that as far as rabbits went, he wasn't conventionally cute. Who'd get tired of petting a cute little fuzzy little bunny anyway? I'll bet there aren't any rabbits like me in that book. You know? You know what I mean? One episode even had him visit Gina's daycare after admitting that he never had a chance to experience it in his childhood. It wasn't uncommon to see Benny join in with songs or games from a distance, much as he hated to admit he was having fun. After 1998, Benny's appearances became scarce, and he soon vanished from the show. It's a shame, too, because he was a funny character with a pretty decent amount of depth. It could be that some kids found him frightening. My girlfriend says she used to be afraid of his angry, bug-eyed appearance, although she has since come to love him. It could also be that when the Furry Arms Hotel stopped showing up, the writers had trouble finding things for Benny to do. Whatever the reason, if there was any character I'd love to bring back most on this list, I think Benny would be the one. Uh, Benny, are you okay? Leave me alone! I'm on my break! Number 5, Betty Lou, typically performed by Lisa Buckley. Betty Lou is one of those characters you might know better from merchandise than you would from the actual show. She was created a year before Prairie Dawn, and the two were often used interchangeably in the early 70s when a little girl character was needed. Prairie, however, always had a consistent performer, Fran Brill, and quickly developed a distinct personality. Betty Lou, on the other hand, was generally passed between Fran Brill and Frank Oz, or sang to pre-recorded vocals by Marilyn Sokol a couple times. Aside from memorably performing the catchy doo-wop song I Want a Monster to Be My Friend, the girl was more of a reoccurring extra than a real character. Despite this, over the years, Betty Lou appeared in many books, records, and as several PVC toys and dolls. Speaking of dolls, in 1993, an effort was made to somewhat balance the gender ratio on the show. While Rosita had been introduced two years prior, 93 introduced Zoe and reintroduced Betty Lou, now consistently performed by Lisa Buckley. Betty Lou was finally given a concrete personality as a major doll lover. Unfortunately, despite there clearly being work put into developing her character further, she still didn't really catch on. It might be rather telling that this was around the time that I watched Sesame Street constantly as a kid, and while I remember seeing Betty Lou in various storybooks, I cannot for the life of me remember seeing her on the actual show. After watching several Betty Lou appearances, I found myself a little disappointed. I mean, we had this forgotten Muppet character who was brought back only for her to once again not really make an impact. I think the one episode that I really did like featured her deciding that a beach ball that Elmo's playing variation of mini golf with was her doll's prince, cursed in the form of a beach toy. Only when Elmo completes his game would the ball turn back into a handsome prince. Oh, and she gave the doll an adorable Southern Belle voice. When the game was over and the ball failed to become prince, she took it in stride. I liked this because her whole game felt very much like the hilariously random things that real kids do imagine all the time. Let's be real, we all played standard games like tag and hide and seek when we were little, but when it came to playing make-believe, some of our fancies could get majorly out there. The whole thing was not only cute, it was downright authentic. If they had kept Betty Lou as this wildly, weirdly imaginative kid, I think her character would have lasted longer. Still. If you pick up a Sesame Street book written between the 70s and the late 90s, you've got a good chance of finding Betty Lou in there. That's more than some characters on this list can say. Number 6. Biff and Sully, performed by Jerry Nelson and Richard Hunt. It wouldn't truly be the city without loud construction workers. Biff and Sully certainly fill that role, two workers who are very proud of what they do. Biff was the talkative one in the duo, so much that Sully never actually spoke in any of his appearances. At a glance, Biff had something of a tough guy demeanor, but usually showed a childlike vulnerability. Meanwhile, despite Sully never speaking, he was just as fun to watch due to how expressive he managed to be. It was definitely the sign of a skilled puppeteer, first Richard Hunt, then David Rudman following Hunt's passing. 
Biff had something of an inflated ego, and while he was a capable handyman, he often thought he was a little more clever than he really was, not to mention he overestimated his piano playing abilities at least twice on the show. Sully, meanwhile, was wiser, more modest, and a highly skilled pianist. Despite Biff's shortcomings, not to mention his often failing to recognize Sully's abilities, he was a good guy at heart. His friendship with Sully was a strong one, his pride in his work was always there, and he was a loving husband, father, and uncle. When Maria and Louise were expecting their baby, Biff gave them important advice. Always show your child you love them. While the two of them didn't quite go down in Muppet history as one of the great pairs, i.e. Ernie and Bert or Statler and Waldorf, they certainly had their moments. Their sketches all had a fun rhythm to them, with Biff often badgering the ever-patient Sully. Their final main appearance was in 1999, but they've popped up in the background in recent episodes from time to time. After all, someone has to keep Sesame Street looking so nice. Never forget the people in your neighborhood. Number 7. Bruno the Trash Man, performed by Carol Spinney. Bruno was a character who was born out of necessity. As Sesame Street grew in popularity and the cast made guest appearances on other shows, there had to be a practical way to get Oscar the Grouch around. Enter the Trash Man. I'm the Trash Man! Sorry, I couldn't resist. Anyway, Carol Spinney came up with a great idea to create a Garbage Man character who would carry Oscar around. Spinney would be in the full-bodied Bruno suit, controlling both Bruno and Oscar. How else would they ever be able to get Oscar on Hee Haw? Bruno first appeared in 1979. In his premiere episode, Oscar was excited to have someone to carry him all around Sesame Street, deciding he liked the change of scenery. Being Oscar, he was chased away from nearly every location after overstaying his welcome. He and Bruno ended up heading to Bruno's main job at the garbage dump, to the relief of everyone. For the most part, Bruno served as a transportation device for Oscar, letting the Grouch do all the talking. They were still close friends, though. On a rare instance without Oscar, Bruno performed bass for the group Bruno and the Trashmen. Gina is apparently a big fan. Here they are. Bruno and the Trashmen! <laughs> Bruno's puppet eventually began to fall apart, and it was sadly opted not to rebuild him. Carol Spinney remembers the character fondly, and in his book The Wisdom of Big Bird, he says his favorite Bruno moment was the end of Follow That Bird, when Bruno slowly walks into the sunset. Oh, and lest you think I only use that Danny DeVito clip as a cheap joke, Bruno and DeVito did appear together in one sketch, waiting at a bus stop. Always a sunny day for these guys. Number 8. Captain Vegetable, originally performed by Jim Henson. Superheroes are a fit bunch. We can only assume that they all eat healthy diets to stay strong and be able to fight injustice. But aside from a few PSAs, did they ever really do much to pass that wisdom on to kids? I mean, when they weren't promoting delicious Hostess fruit pies, of course. Luckily for us, your newest favorite superhero is picking up the slack. Little is known of Captain Vegetable, other than that he lives in a secret garden somewhere in New Jersey. Perhaps his parents were killed by a giant chocolate bar in an alley one night. Perhaps his home planet was destroyed and he was sent to Earth in a giant carrot. Perhaps he set out from an idyllic island inhabited only by peace-loving rabbits into the carnivore's world to teach love and vegetarianism. Whatever his secret origin, we do know that he is always armed with his trusty carrot and celery. If you are seen eating anything other than vegetables, you may get a visit from this weirdo. Do I look like a weirdo? Captain Vegetable is best remembered for his first appearance. Jim Henson performed the character in a song where he came across Andy, who loved candy, and Eddie, who loved spaghetti, and taught them to stop worrying and love the vegetable instead. He appeared a few other times later on, performed by Richard Hunt. Henson and Hunt's performances were noticeably different. Henson's Captain Vegetable had a real air of confidence about him. Hunt's version, however, seemed a little more desperate to live up to the whole newest favorite superhero title. Given that the puppets were slightly different as well, we could be looking at two different rabbits who have taken up the mantle of Captain Vegetable. Further cementing my theory that Captain Vegetable is a legacy character, we had another person who took up the mantle. None other than Mr. John Leguizamo. Leguizamo being an actor, writer, and all-around great person? Just a front. His true passion lies in instilling healthy values on kids. What a guy. I had this great idea for a movie called Into the Veggieverse, where all the different Captain Vegetables come together, but I had to drop it when I heard that Christopher Nolan was planning to make his own movie with a darker, grittier take on the Captain Vegetable mythos. Composer Hans Zimmer is attached to the project, stating in interviews that he's opting out of the happy, jolly Captain Vegetable theme, and has instead conceived an ambient soundscape, featuring the sample audio of Nolan crunching on a carrot. Number 9, Chicago the Lion, performed by David Rudman. Sadly, our next character, to my knowledge, never had a crossover with Captain Vegetable. 
just as Billy Batson has Talkie Tawny the Tiger, how cool would it be for our newest favorite superhero to be with a lion by his side? Chicago, first and foremost, is a vegetarian. This cat loves veggies so much he once made a vegetable juice bar that happened to be free of charge, and sang an ode to Broccoli, complete with a slightly reluctant Selena dancing to the song in full costume. Of course, he still has his predatory instincts, but he's found a non-violent solution. He plays a game with the local kids where they pretend to be vegetables so we can chase them. Chicago is unusual for a lion, and he can get self-conscious. He once ashamedly admitted that he had never actually been to the jungle. Nevertheless, everyone on Sesame Street likes him just the way he is. I wish I had a little more to say about Chicago. I've included him on this list because he appeared most frequently in the early to mid-90s, so I remember him fondly. At the same time, while watching his old sketches was a nice nostalgic blast for me, I couldn't find too much else to say on the character, which could be why he stopped appearing after a while. Either way, it won't change my happy memories of seeing him as a kid. Number 10, Chip and Dip, performed by Kevin Clash and Richard Hunt. Chip and Dip were a pair of identical cats that hung around the street, mostly in the mid-80s. The pair were mischievous, often going out of their way to annoy Oscar or steal food from other people, usually sandwiches. In other words, they acted a lot like real cats. Despite having some nice potential, the pair was somewhat underutilized. Eventually, they were used more as generic cats when needed in a sketch. I don't have a ton to say about them, but they definitely are on the list of Sesame Street characters you don't recall until you see a picture of them, and then you remember seeing them on a VHS a few times, and even though they didn't have that much of an impact on you now or then, it's still nice to see them again. It's a rather long-winded title for a list, but it gets the job done. Number 11, Calambo, performed by Joey Mazzarino. Calambo was, of course, a parody of the long-running detective show Columbo, about a detective who more or less played dumb to get criminals to let their guard down. I will say, though, that Columbo's actor Peter Falk did make a memorable cameo in The Great Muppet Caper. Columbo was a lamb detective who primarily investigated nursery rhyme-based crimes, like figuring out that Jack Horner had stolen a plum from a pie. Other times, he appeared on Sesame Street solving the characters' dilemmas. One of his most memorable cases involved helping Nick Chicken, hilariously played by Kevin Klein, find his adopted sister Nora Chicken, who had disappeared. Another case had everyone begin braying like sheep, with only Columbo being able to translate. As far as Muppet Detectives went, Columbo was better at his job than, say, Sherlock Hemlock, but let's be real, that's not saying too much. While Columbo did solve some cases on his own, other times it was dumb luck, like when he helped find Oscar's missing elf and Fluffy, who happened to show up behind Maria and Gabby just as Columbo was questioning them. In regards to the missing Nora chicken case, it was actually Telly Monster who came up with an idea on how to find Nora, not Columbo. Oh, and one more thing. Columbo is very important to his performer, Joey Mazzarino, who was a longtime writer of Sesame Street, and even the head writer for seasons 40 to 46. His audition script was where Columbo originated. Number 12. Countess Darling Von Darling, performed by Brian Meal. There have been several countesses over the years, many of them being romantic partners for the Count. Countess Von Darling, however, was the Count's fifth cousin and only appeared in season 12 of the show, watching the Count's castle while he was away taking care of business in Transylvania. The Muppet Wiki describes his business as a counting emergency, whatever the heck that is. The Countess is always accompanied by her dachshund Masha, performed by Karen Prell, who helps her remember certain numbers. The most notable aspect of the Countess is what happens when she finishes counting. The Count, of course, is accompanied by the sound of thunder and flash of lightning. The Countess is accompanied by a downpour, even indoors. For this reason, people seemed to dread her counting in a few appearances. To my knowledge, no one's ever been struck by the Count's lightning, but rain indoors is a bit much. Ironically, in her final known appearance, the gang wanted her to count to make rain for some plants. Adding to the irony, the Countess mistakenly believed that Masha had a cold and left halfway through her counting, not even letting it rain at all. We can only assume that when the Count returned from his emergency, the Countess and Masha left, for once, a plot-relevant reason to why a character stopped appearing. Number 13, Cousin Monster, originally performed by Bob Payne. Different seasons of Sesame Street have had different curriculums in focus. Season 36 in 2005, for example, focused on healthy eating. One promoted song was sung by Hoots the Owl to Cookie Monster called A Cookie is a Sometimes Food. Despite the title of the song, Cookie Monster did still eat a cookie afterwards. Around the same time, Grover appeared on Jimmy Kimmel Live to promote a DVD called Healthy Happy Monsters, and innocently ad-libbed a joke about Cookie Monster going on a diet. The combination of these two events opened the floodgates for the press. A long-standing rumor quickly began that Cookie Monster was off sweets for good, and was even changing his name to Veggie Monster. 
This was all untrue, of course, never mind the fact that Cookie Monster had already taught kids about healthy choices in songs and PSAs as early as 1974. The funny thing is, one of Cookie's family members was already technically a Veggie Monster. Making her debut in 1979, Cousin Monster bewildered Cookie Monster when she showed no interest in sweets, but was delighted by Ernie's grocery bag of vegetables. I've only been able to find two sketches with this adorable tyke, but she's quite charming, and I think that bringing her back would be a good move. Outside of her appearances as Cousin Monster, the puppet was used as Cookie Monster's sister during his inspirational song, Me Gotta Be Blue, and as a shoulder angel in Don't Eat the Pictures. It's funny how an innocent joke and song about moderation spawn an urban legend that refuses to die. To this day, Sesame Street writers and characters affirm that Cookie Monster is still Cookie Monster. I suppose it's kind of comforting that Cookie has built up such a fanbase who love him just the way he is. And wherever his cousin is, I hope she's enjoying some nice carrot sticks. Number 14, Dina and Pearl, performed by Karen Prell and Brian Meal. Dina and Pearl, with Dina in particular, is a nice example of a well-intentioned idea gone wrong. According to longtime Sesame Street writer Norman Stiles, while it is now understood that play is an important part of a child's brain development, it wasn't promoted as much in the 80s. For season 11 in 1980, a reddish monster named Dina was introduced to stress the importance of play. For Dina, playing is akin to what cookies are to Cookie Monster or counting is to the count. In the following season, Dina was redesigned into a purple, googly-eyed monster. In addition, her caretaker, Pearl, was introduced. It was unclear as to what their specific relationship was, but they were definitely not mother and daughter. Four known sketches were filmed in the monster's cave-like dwelling, where Dina would pester Pearl into playing with her. Dina, it's not time to play. It's time to go to sleep. Ugh. Any time time to play. In the meantime, Dina would appear out on Sesame Street itself, interacting with the usual characters. So why did Dina and Pearl not make the cut after season 12 ended? In the words of Norman Stiles, Dina's insistence on playing was more annoying than endearing. Having watched a few Dina sketches, I couldn't agree more. While only one Dina and Pearl sketch is available online in English, the rest are foreign dubs, it's just not terribly funny or engaging, and instead feels like a knockoff Ernie and Bert routine. I could only find two other Dina appearances, one with Maria and one with Olivia, and neither of them were that interesting, although Olivia did have a nice song in one of them at the very least. Not counting her four sketches with Pearl, Dina appeared in two dozen episodes of Sesame Street, many of which are not available online or on DVD. However, having read the descriptions of the scenes and seeing Dina in action a few times, I can safely assume we're really not missing much. Thankfully for Karen Prell, a few years later she performed a much more likable character who was also obsessed with playing, Red Fraggle. Number 15, Dexter, performed by Kevin Clash and Fred Garbo. In an episode from season 17, Big Bird and Snuffy investigate a mystery. Various objects, all of them round, are disappearing on Sesame Street. Eventually, they track down the culprit, a large purple monster named Dexter, who's borrowed the items to juggle with. Dexter loved juggling, and that was about it. He was quite talented and assured the others that he could stop anytime, he just didn't feel like it. While you might be thinking that a one-dimensional character was bound to disappear if they didn't flesh him out, there was more to the story of Dexter's sudden departure. Kevin Clash, who puppeteered Dexter's head, explained that another performer, Fred Garbo, who also performed Barkley the Dog at the time, did the juggling. While both men were very talented at what they did, actually coordinating the puppeteering and the juggling was next to impossible. Around the same year Labyrinth had come out, and featured a similar trick with Jareth, where juggler Michael Motion would stand behind David Bowie to do the tricks with the orbs. However, basing an entire character around this proved to be too difficult. Clash went so far as to call Dexter Sesame Street's most spectacular failure. Outside of his debut, Dexter would only appear three more times on the show in the next couple episodes. One sketch had him attempt to prove to Susan that he could stop compulsively juggling. Another had him teaching Gordon how to juggle. The final appearance had Dexter in the background of a party doing what else but juggling. After that, he picked up his juggling balls and departed as quickly as he'd arrived. Number 16, Don Music, performed by Richard Hunt. While the creative process can be fun and enriching, it can also be frustrating and headache-inducing. No one knows this better than Don Music, the esteemed songwriter and tortured artist. Don's sketches were all pretty much the same, but it didn't stop them from being entertaining. Typically, Kermit the Frog would be interviewing Don about his work in progress, a song guaranteed to be a hit. If Don could figure out how to end it. The songs would usually be your classics like Mary Had a Little Lamb or Yankee Doodle, although no one ever pointed out to Don that these songs had already been written. 
Knowing his temperamental, self-destructive tendencies, he probably would have had an aneurysm if he realized this. What uh. is life anyway? Uh. Anyway, Don would be stuck on the final rhyme and would angrily berate himself and bash his head against the piano. Kermit would work backwards with Don through the song until it was lyrically a different song entirely. For instance, Mary Had a Little Lamb became Mary Had a Bicycle, and the Sesame Street theme itself became a song about finding Yellowstone Park on a stormy night. Appearing from 1974 to 1991, Don Music was a funny character who taught kids about rhyming, and arguably how to get creative when solving a problem. So why was he dropped? Well, when he banged his head against the piano in anguish, apparently kids in the audience would imitate him. As a result, a few later sketches didn't have Don bash his head, at least not as much. But without that aspect, a certain spark was gone, and Don was eventually retired for good. Number 17, Elizabeth, performed by Stephanie DeBruzzo. Elizabeth was best described by her performer. Said Stephanie DeBruzzo, she was a red-headed, pigtailed little girl with a loud, nasal, Queen-slash-Brooklyn-accented voice, who I loved because she was so unlike your typical little girl characters. Elizabeth was introduced in 1997 as the best friend of a little boy named Jerome, who has just moved to Sesame Street and is already missing Elizabeth back home. At the end, Elizabeth visits him. In future episodes, Elizabeth apparently moved to Sesame Street herself, and Jerome is nowhere to be seen. Not that an average four-year-old is going to point out continuity issues on the show or anything. That's for weirdos on YouTube like me to do. Despite being charmingly performed, Elizabeth didn't get too much of a chance to develop as a character, outside of her enthusiastic devotion to her adorable kitten, Little Murray Sparkles, performed by Alice Deneen. Elizabeth appeared on a semi-frequent basis in the year 2000, and then kind of faded away. It's always a shame when a likable character vanishes like that, and I certainly wouldn't be opposed to seeing her make a comeback someday. As long as Little Murray Sparkles is there, too, of course. Number 18, Ernestine and Brad, performed by David Rudman and Richard Hunt. I'm including these two in one entry, despite them never appearing on screen together to my knowledge. However, they're relatives of everyone's favorite Sesame Street duo, Ernie and Bert, so why not let them share this one? Brad, Bert's nephew, first appeared in 1977. Bert played the role of the proud, doting uncle and happily showed Brad off to everyone a few times on Sesame Street. Cute as Brad is, the only sketch with him available for viewing online is an adorable bit where Ernie helps Bert find Brad some bath toys, before completely going overboard. Brad's reaction to a large shark toy is especially priceless. How about, how about a shark to swim? Ah! No, no, ah! it's, it's okay. It's okay, play just, shark. Just to pretend. Ah! Yeah, just shark pretend. to, uh, okay, to Ernestine, meanwhile, is Ernie's cousin making her debut in 1985. She bears more than a striking resemblance to Ernie, even emulating his laugh. <laughs> There's a little more Ernestine material available to the public. She's been in a few sketches with Ernie, a song where Olivia tried to take her picture, and the VHS The Best of Ernie and Bert, where she, Gina, and Big Bird looked at Ernie and Bert's photo album. As I said before, Ernestine and Brad never appeared together, which is a real missed opportunity. The cuteness levels would have been off the charts. Oh, and I can't forget to mention Brad's father, Bart. He's a loud, sleazy traveling salesman who needs to be seen to be believed. But I really want to tell you, you must be Ernie. <laughs> well, Ernie, I just came into town by way of Buffalo. But next time, I'll take the train. Wah, 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 wah. Oh, I'm a guest. I really wonder how that kid is going to grow up. Number 19, Farley, performed by Jerry Nelson. What can we say about Farley? Wow, what can we say about Farley? This little green boy was introduced in season two and appeared in many sketches, books, and records, and yet he never really developed anything resembling a personality. For a character that appeared fairly often, you'd think I could find something more to say about him, but I can't. And that's why he's on this list because it's so strange that Farley was used somewhat regularly in the 70s, and yet I can't really describe his character at all. Unlike Betty Lou, who I talked about previously, there was no real effort ever made to develop Farley whatsoever. After all, Betty Lou was revived from a need to add more gender equality to the street. We already had enough distinct male characters. After the 70s, Farley popped up twice more, once in 1996 and again in 2000. Nothing really came of those appearances, however. It's just an odd little conundrum. What can we say about Farley? Number 20, Forgetful Jones, typically performed by Richard Hunt. Well, we may have not had too much to say about Farley, but Forgetful Jones is another story. 
Created by the aforementioned writer Norman Stiles, Forgetful Jones is a cowboy who, as his nickname implies, has a lot of trouble remembering things. According to Stiles, Jones was meant to teach kids how to remember something they've forgotten, and to stress that everyone forgets things sometimes. This is why other characters may get frustrated with Forgetful Jones, but they rarely ever get angry at him. Despite forgetting nearly anything and everything all the time, Forgetful had his moments of competence. In one sketch with Louise, Forgetful apparently forgot he spoke English, and it was revealed that he was bilingual, speaking perfect Spanish instead. In another sketch, coincidentally also with Louise, Forgetful revealed that if he wrote something down on a calendar, he was able to remember not only the upcoming event, but also a plethora of minute details. Of course, he probably usually forgets to write things down in the first place, so... Forgetful Jones was introduced in 1980 and performed by Michael Earle. About a year later, Richard Hunt took over. While a character like Forgetful Jones could easily become annoying, it was thanks to Hunt's endearing performance that he was a lovable coot who you couldn't help but want to succeed. Most of the time, you're rooting for Forgetful to remember, and happy when he pulls it off with the support of his friends. I should also mention his girlfriend Clementine, performed first by Brian Meal, then Kevin Clash, and finally Camille Bonora, and his horse Buster, performed by Martin P. Robinson. His friends are a great source of support and help to Forgetful, even if they can get a little testy at times, especially Clementine. After Hunt's passing in 1992, the character was more or less retired, making only background appearances. In 2019, however, Forgetful Jones made a few small speaking appearances, including at Comic-Con, and a video where he mixes up his and Bert's laundry. Only time will tell if Forgetful Jones will truly remember how to get to Sesame Street and become a recurring character again. Whether he does or not, We'll certainly never forget him. Number 21, Frazzle. As I said before, the first season of Sesame Street featured some intimidating looking monsters who were generally phased out to make way for cuter ones. One of the only legitimately scary looking monsters to appear after season one was Frazzle, who first showed up in the early to mid 70s. In his theme song, it was explained that despite Frazzle's fierce appearance and growls, he was actually a nice guy who just happened to have limited communication skills. After only a few appearances in the 70s and 80s, Frazzle disappeared, before being brought back in 1992 and made somewhat regular appearances until 1998. Here, his vulnerable, sensitive side was emphasized more, with Frazzle being shown to be shy around new people, easily frustrated with crayons, and frightened of the dark and Benny Rabbit's ears. Don't be frightened by his ears, Frazzle. He, they, they won't hurt you. I'm getting out of here! Oh, no, 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 Benny, Listen, Benny, Benny, I don't even Benny, understand Benny. what he's saying, and he's, I know he's saying something I, I, negative. I, 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 Several episodes revolved around Frazzle in this era, including one where he attempted to find a way to play with baby Natasha, and one where he roped Maria and Bob into reading him a very, very repetitive book. My favorite Frazzle moment was one where he was at a sleepover and taught Big Bird and Gordon his favorite lullaby, which of course consisted of nonsense words and unintelligible growling. Can I just take a brief moment to mention how much I love all of the Sesame Street humans? I mean, I know this video is focusing on the Muppets, but I have a lot of respect for all the humans who don't quite get the love they deserve. Unless you're Tim Curry or David Bowie, it's very easy to get upstaged by the Muppets, let's be real on this. But the show wouldn't be the same without our beloved humans holding it all together, and I hope no one forgets that. After 1998, Frazzle pretty much disappeared again. I can't find any statements on why exactly, but he could have still proved to be too frightening to children in the audience. Ironically, a lot of YouTube comments I've found on Frazzle's episodes have been fairly positive. Perhaps Frazzle resonates a little better with adults rather than kids. On a personal note, Frazzle is one of my favorite Muppets on this list. I had a copy of the Monster Hits VHS when I was little, and I couldn't get enough of him. Number 22. Harvey Knee Slapper, performed by Frank Oz. Okay, stop me if you've heard this one. A man is looking in a paper bag and giggling at something. Another man curiously approaches. The first man asks, wanna see? The second man says yes, and the first man slaps a letter C on the second man's chest. Cue the mad laughter. What I just described sums up about 90% of Harvey's appearances on Sesame Street. A practical joker specializing in bad puns, Harvey plagued the Anything Muppets for quite a while, and while his shtick got a bit stale, I recall always smiling at least a little when I saw his sketches. Although he rarely appeared on the street proper, the few times Harvey did visit Sesame Street, it was revealed that even the kind-hearted humans like Louise, Susan, and Bob barely tolerated him. 
On that note, on the rare occasion that one of Harvey's annoying pranks backfired on him, it was very satisfying. Harvey Kneeslapper was dropped partially because he was a one-note character, and partially because his grating laugh began to really bother Frank Oz's throat. Harvey material was filmed from 1971 to 1977, but was reran on the show as late as 2001. It's probably a good thing that Harvey kept his pranks regulated to Sesame Street and its neighboring areas. If he pulled any of that kind of stuff anywhere else, especially in New York, he'd probably end up in the hospital. Number 23. Professor Hastings, performed by Frank Oz. Professor Hastings was another one of those one-joke characters that didn't make the cut after a few tries. He was an elderly lecturer who was prone to dozing off during his dull speeches, and needed characters like Kermit to wake him up. One of the children's television workshop advisors, Gerald S. Lesser, even described the professor as verging on senility. Oh dear. While it sounds kind of amusing on paper, Professor Hastings proved to be too boring to the point that it stopped being funny. He was so boring, in fact, that the test audiences of kids actually fell asleep when he did. Only a few brief appearances of the professor are available in English, the rest are foreign dubs. Honestly, I don't think they're all that worth seeking out. While Frank Oz is normally a great performer, even he couldn't seem to salvage this character, who's pretty much a chore to watch. Sorry, Professor. Number 24. Herbert Birdsfoot, performed by Jerry Nelson. In the show's first season, Kermit was often used as a straight man to the monsters. The beloved frog took his job as an educator seriously, and would attempt to give simple lectures to his audience only for characters like Grover or Cookie Monster to mess things up, sometimes accidentally, sometimes on purpose. However, as Season 2 entered production, Kermit was deemed too commercial, and was replaced with the Ned Flanders-esque Herbert Birdsfoot. Hello, Mr. Birdsfoot. Hi, Big Bird. Can I call you Herbert? Oh, certainly. Please. Okay, Mr. Birdsfoot. Mr. Birdsfoot essentially filled the same role as Mr. the Frog, but while Kermit was quick to lose his cool at Grover and Company, Herbert usually kept his composure. Thus, the character did not pack the same punch as Kermit. In fact, he barely packed a punch at all. The only time I remember being amused by Herbert was in a sketch where he demonstrates over and under by stacking heavy objects on a visibly miserable Grover. Still, the apathetic lecturer and distressed assistant would be later done much better with Bunsen and Beaker. So it came to no surprise when Herbert was quickly phased out by the end of Season 2, and Kermit returned in Season 3. An amazing uh, exhibition of verbal dexterity, Big Bird. Well, <clears throat> I hope you learned something. Herbert? Herbert? Number 25. Joey and Davy Monkey, performed by Joey Mazzarino and David Rudman. Monkeys are silly and fun. Sesame Street is silly and fun. So why not add a little monkey business to the street we love? First appearing in 1992, these monkeys were always up for an adventure, provided it ended with them finding slash eating bananas. Or, as they said it, bananas. In one of their first appearances, they even mistook Big Bird for their favorite fruit. Big Bird set the record straight with a Mambo-style song called I Am Not a Banana, which is honestly one of the strangest Sesame Street numbers I think I've ever heard. I am not a banana, a banana's a thing that I am not. Although I may be yellow, let me tell you, little fellow, I am not a banana, no! Joey and Davy were something of a mixed bag. Sometimes they could be charming and funny, other times they could be somewhat grating. I saw them quite a bit as a kid, but they never left a lasting impression on me. I have the feeling they're kept around for so long because their performers, who the monkeys were named after, had a good time playing the parts and bounced off each other well. Actually, it's the puppeteer's chemistry that really makes the monkey scenes work. At least most of the time. While I don't miss Joey and Davy terribly much, they're still a decent-sized piece of 90 Sesame Street. Number 26, Kingston Livingston III, performed by Kevin Clash. Speaking of 90 Sesame Street, here's a truly unique specimen. Kingston prided himself in his individuality, trying to do something new and different every day. Everyone's wearing their hat a certain way? Expect Kingston to wear his hat a different way. Everyone has the same lunchbox? Not Kingston. He marches to the beat of his own drummer and encourages kids to experiment and step out of their comfort zone. He also encourages literacy, often reading and writing stories. Sometimes accompanying Kingston is his gang of friends, aka Kingston's crew. Often befuddled by Kingston's antics, they sometimes accept their friend for who he is, and sometimes take a little bit of convincing before they come around. 
1997 episode I found particularly showed off their difficult side. In this one, they are a quartet called Crew 4, who do cheers and chants about how great the number 4 is. Remember, we're, we're on Sesame Street. Big Bird invites Kingston to play soccer with him, and the rest of Crew 4 get angry that Kingston dare leave. They can't be Crew 4 with only three people. It suggested they form Crew 3 instead. They don't want to be Crew 3. It suggested they join Kingston and Big Bird's soccer game. They don't like soccer. It suggested that Gordon fill in for Kingston. Well, Gordon's not Kingston. Well, it's an accurate portrayal of how stubborn people can be sometimes, and every story needs a conflict, I found them in this appearance and a few others to be, ugh, dare I say it, kind of snotty. I almost wondered why Kingston hung out with them so much. I never saw that much of Kingston in my childhood, uh, mostly knowing him as that guy who sang about animals having birthday parties. I found myself charmed by him when I watched these old clips and wishing he'd lasted longer. Number 27, Lefty the Salesman, performed by Frank Oz. Ah, Sesame Street. As close to paradise as we might get. This idyllic street is truly the... Wait. Who's the shady-looking guy in the overcoat trying to sell me something? Lefty is a salesman who often sells useless items. Like the best of his kind, he's mastered the art of the sales pitch and loves to unload his junk on any patsy he can find. And more often than not, it's Ernie. His wares have included an invisible ice cream cone and a batch of air. But Lefty's not just a huckster. He also has underworld connections. Yes, you heard that right. In a few sketches, we've seen Lefty with his boss, a sinister, or at least sinister for Sesame Street mobster, performed by Jerry Nelson. At least once, they've stolen a golden Ann, whatever that is, and usually meet in a dark wharf area. In one sketch, a different group of criminals are going over their secret knock, and a different character named Lefty, performed by Jim Henson, can't seem to remember the fine details. This Lefty was a paranoid jittery fellow. It made me wonder if Lefty is just a derogatory nickname for gangster assistance. New Lefty material stopped being filmed after season 6, but he appeared in reruns for years afterwards. Who knew Sesame Street had such a dark underbelly? Number 28. Leo the Party Monster, performed by Richard Hunt. A lot of Sesame Street characters are defined by their love of one certain thing. Cookies, counting, juggling, playing, even triangles. For some reason. So why not introduce a character obsessed with partying? Leo the Party Monster is well-versed in the art of the party. Or as he would put it, the party. Leo burst onto the scene in 1986. In addition to throwing a block party, he also taught Telly the fine art of partying. It's something people have to practice, apparently and ran a literal party line where callers could discuss parties. Richard Hunt gave his usual fun performance, and there was nothing wrong with Leo. He was really fun. I have a feeling that he was dropped because the writers had trouble coming up with good material. Sesame Street sketches all need to have some sort of lesson or educational value. The key is making it fun and engaging. Leo was fun and engaging, but I have a feeling it was hard to use him as a teaching device. And so I say farewell, Leo. R.I.P. Really impressive partier. Number 29, Little Bird, typically performed by Fran Brill. I was always fond of this cute little character, but I never actually saw him on the show proper. I only knew Little Bird from his appearances in books, where he was something of a rational thinking foil for the goofy Big Bird. Despite testing very well with kids, Little Bird was rarely used on Sesame Street, and I can't really figure out why. If kids reacted well to him, and he was cute, i.e. marketable, why not use him more? Well, I'm not really sure why, but he was definitely underused. The Little Bird puppet was first used in a series of Kenner toy commercials, where he was called the Kenner Goonie Bird. He is performed in these commercials by Jim Henson, who also performed Little Bird in his first couple appearances. After that, Fran Brill took over the character for the most part, with Jerry Nelson occasionally performing him instead. In a few appearances, Little Bird took the role of a teacher of sorts, showing what next to means, and leading the kids in the imagination game. Outside of these early appearances, his biggest role was in a 1990 episode where he tried to move from the park to Sesame Street, but finding a new home proved to be harder than he had thought. Interestingly, this episode referred to Little Bird as a girl, despite all other appearances of the character using masculine pronouns. While Little Bird was often portrayed in the books as a close friend of Big Bird, it could be that Snuffy's introduction ended up reducing that role. Also, while Big Bird was originally a little sillier and something of a bumbler, he later became more innocent and dreamy. Thus, Little Bird's role as Big Bird's smarter foil also kind of diminished. Whatever the reason, I'll always be fond of Little Bird, and once again, wish he had a bigger role on the show. Number 30. Little Chrissy, voiced by Christopher Surf. 
Lil Chrissy was one of the big rock stars of Sesame Street, singing songs like Count It Higher, Eight Balls of Fur, and Raise Your Hand. He often performed with his backup singers as Little Chrissy and the Alphabets. Most of his songs were written by Christopher Surf, who also voiced Chrissy, with Jim Henson often doing the puppeteering. Little Chrissy is known for his catchy songs and enthusiastic performances. His piano playing was so spirited he sometimes broke the piano. This was apparently based on his voice actor doing the same thing, although I doubt he demolished it to the point that Little Chrissy did. Little Chrissy's final performance to date was in 1999, playing music for Patti LaBelle who sang the Gospel Alphabet. After Chrissy's retirement, pianos everywhere sighed in relief. Number 31, Little Jerry, performed by Jerry Nelson. In season one of the show, being in the late 60s and all, a recurring group of hippies would pop up to sing songs like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. They didn't always have an educational purpose, but were rather just for fun. Eventually, the hippies evolved into the group Little Jerry and the Monotones, featuring Little Jerry singing lead. I can't help but compare Little Jerry to Little Chrissy, who we talked about in the last video. Both were wild-haired performers with Little in their title, although if I had to choose which one I liked more, I'd probably go with Little Chrissy. Not that I dislike Jerry, of course, I think that I just like Chrissy's songs a bit more. Still, once you hear Little Jerry singing telephone rock, it'll be hard to get out of your head. Little Jerry was often backed up by Big Jeffy, who was voiced by Jeff Moss, the person who wrote most of the Little Jerry songs. Big Jeffy sometimes sang back up for Lil Chrissy instead of Lil Jerry. In fact, Jeffy and Chrissy both appeared in one episode to ask Elmo to fill in for Lil Jerry when he was sick with the chicken pox. In their final appearance in 2000, the band visited Sesame Street for a special concert where they performed a song about computers. Gotta stay with the times, I guess. After that, the band appeared to retire for good, although they did inspire Big Bird, Snuffy, Prairie Dawn, and Elmo to form their own band. And the circle of rock goes on. Number 32, Merry Monster, performed by Joey Mazzarino. Merry Monster was introduced in 1991 and was characterized largely by her voice. She had two main ways of speaking, a soft whisper and a loud, shrill shout. She even had the ability to outroar Chicago the Lion. Sometimes, Mary appeared to be innocently unaware of how loud she was being. Other times, she used it to her advantage. For example, one episode had Mary attempting to frighten people by appearing suddenly and shouting. She rationalizes that she's a monster, and that's what monsters should do. This raised a lot of questions from me, wondering if this is a scenario where some monsters have simply evolved past scaring others, or if the Sesame Street monsters have just been domesticated or something. I know I'm overthinking things, but that's what YouTubers do. Either way, after badly scaring Barkley the dog, Mary realizes that maybe it's better to be friendly. Another episode which I haven't found on YouTube, but rather read about on Muppet Wiki, has Mary loudly shouting about bread, scaring Telly so much he develops a Pavlovian fear of bread. I really want to see this one, it sounds really silly. After 1995, Mary only made cameos and background appearances, putting her in the large category of cute characters who the writers apparently didn't know what to do with. Number 33, Meryl Sheep, performed by Camille Benora. First gracing the street in 1987, Miss Sheep was obviously a Meryl Streep spoof, right down to her accent being based on Streep's Polish accent and Sophie's Choice, although Meryl Sheep's accent sounded a little more Norwegian. Despite her status as a celebrity, Miss Sheep was often seen hanging around Sesame Street, helping others with acting advice. In fact, one sketch had her saying to interviewer Baba Walters, I hope the writers are proud of that one, I know I would be, that she doesn't consider herself that different from other sheep. I didn't know much about Meryl Sheep going in, but after watching a few of her appearances, I found her incredibly endearing. She stopped appearing in 1990, but perhaps she's appearing in sheep-centric movies somewhere now. If you're going to watch one Meryl Sheep appearance, I choose the one where she gives Susan Saran an acting lessons. It's adorable. Okay, now, take a deep breath. <sighs> Yeah, now relax, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, now concentrate. Number 34, The Miami Mice, performed by Martin P. Robinson and Kevin Clash. Sesame Street has had a long history of their movie and TV spoofs, which was essentially the whole point of the beloved Monsterpiece Theater sketches and their spiritual sequel, Cookie's Crummy Pictures. These sketches were good for the parents watching the show with their kids. It was a nice way of giving the adults something to chuckle at that the children might not fully understand, but would enjoy regardless. Most of these sketches were one-shots, but from 1986 to 1989, 
a series of four Miami Vice spoofs were produced starring Tito, Martin P. Robinson, and JP, Kevin Clash, as the Miami Mice. The Miami Mice were chiefly two things, helpful and fashionable, and not necessarily in that order. One of their toughest cases involved the Count wandering into their closet and throwing all their clothes around while counting them. The mice had to lure the vampire out by tempting him with hundreds of palm trees to count. Another case had them help Ernie with a hostage situation. Well, kind of. Uh, Ernie thinks that a toy repair shop is holding his beloved rubber ducky prisoner, but it turns out it just wasn't open yet. Miami Vice's final season was in 1989, which is when the Miami Mice made their last appearance on Sesame Street, having been called all the way from Miami to New York so the Count could count them. They had bad luck with that guy. With Miami Vice no longer relevant, the mice went back to Florida and stayed there. Actually, it was a little weird seeing Ernie travel all the way from New York to Florida just to get his ducky fixed. Then again, he and Bert have explored an Egyptian pyramid before, so who am I to nitpick? Either way, the Miami mice had a longer run than some spoof characters, but I don't think they mind this case being closed. An adventure! Something exciting is about to happen, yes? No, Frogo! It's quitting time! Ah. Let's Number 35. Mona, Frida, and Juliet. Performed by Cheryl Blaylock, Fran Brill, Michael Elizabeth Houston, and Camille Benora. Douglas Adams, well, technically Bob Dylan, once asked, how many rows must a man walk down? The answer is 42. But the question today is, how many times must a puppet change her identity? The answer is 4. This familiar blue puppet was first used as Mona, Telly's older sister who had a big imagination. Appearing in only season 13, 1982, Mona was performed by Cheryl Blaylock and was often seen doing things like pretending to drive a car or pretending to be a tree. In what appears to be the only English clip of her available, she meets Snuffy and is startled to find out that he's not as imaginary as everyone told her he is. Um, the bird? Hmm? I have something to tell you. What? Um, your imaginary friend... I don't want to disappoint you or anything, but he's real! The puppet was then renamed Frida, performed by Fran Brill, and used for a single song in season 16. Frida sang a song called New Baby about the different emotions an older sibling might have. If that baby puppet looks familiar to you, don't worry, we'll get there. In season 18, the puppet became Juliet, who was a neurotic warrior, much like Telly. In fact, she and Telly were very close, and at times, based on the episode descriptions, appeared to have something of a precocious crush on each other. This would be cute if it weren't for the fact that Juliet looked identical to Telly's older sister. But what if you're not here when I come back? What if you don't come back? <sighs> Maybe I better not go. Hey, Telly, come on, jump in! Well, okay, I, I promise to come back if you promise to be here, Juliet. I promise. Sadly, I could only find a few brief clips of Juliet, making her slightly less elusive than Mona. For her first few appearances, Juliet was performed by Michael Elizabeth Houston, and later by Camille Benora. Finally, in season 25, the puppet found its true self as Ingrid. The baby from the Frida song became her daughter, Natasha, along with the mother puppet becoming her husband, Humphrey. Sometimes, things just take a while to fall into place. Oh wait, do Humphrey and Ingrid even appear on the show anymore? Oops. Oh well, moving on! Number 36, Dr. Noble Price, originally performed by Brian Meal. Well, we've got another one-joke character here. First appearing in 1980, Dr. Nobel Price's gimmick was that he would constantly invent or discover things that already existed. These things included a record player, a rabbit, and, most depressingly, a pair of socks he apparently spent five years developing. In a 1983 episode, he discovered a Snuffleupagus named Abigail, Snuffy's cousin, and was distraught when Big Bird told him that there were plenty of those around. Given the fact that none of the human-slash-authority figures believed in Snuffy at the time, it's actually quite nice that Dr. Price actually listened to Big Bird. Too bad nothing came of that miraculous discovery for another two years. Dr. Price was definitely the eccentric type, constantly tripping over his long lab coat. Most of his research was done on a remote tropical island, so we could all be laughing at a poor man going insane from isolation. Shame on us. Kermit would often report on those findings, although one sketch had a new character, Warren Wolf, performed by Kevin Clash, standing in. Warren was created as a character to replace Kermit due to Jim Henson's many other commitments. If you're wondering, no, Warren will not be featured in this list of characters since he was only used that one time 
and there honestly isn't that much to say about him. Luckily for Dr. Price, in a 1986 episode, he invented the unique flower-holding, towel-drying, ear-scratching, sit-upon thing that, as its title states, has many uses. This dog truly had his day. If only he could come up with a better name. At least it's descriptive. Dr. Price appeared from 1980 to 1988, performed by Brian Meal for the first four years and Kevin Clash for the latter. Who knows? Maybe when we get that next transmission from his remote lab, he'll have created something truly wonderful. Or he'll just have reinvented the wheel. Time will tell. Number 37. Placido Flamingo, performed by Richard Hunt. Named after the famous opera singer Placido Domingo, Placido Flamingo was also a famous opera singer, at least in the world of Sesame Street. Like Meryl Sheep, it was a bit odd how, despite his fame, he'd often be seen hanging around the pleasant New York street corner, then doing whatever famous opera singers normally do. I don't know how much money famous opera singers make, or what they choose to do with their earnings, but perhaps they're things best not mentioned in a video about Sesame Street. Placido Flamingo had a beautiful voice, and he knew it. He was not above casually reminding others of how famous he was, although he did have an undeniable charm in spite of his ego. Placido was introduced in 1986 to help bring classical music appreciation to the show. Sometimes he would sing an original song, while other times he sang variations on songs from operas like The Barber of Seville and Naughty Marietta. One of his most memorable episodes had Placido falling head over heels in love with Maria, despite her being in committed relationship with Louise although not yet married at the time. Placido sang outside Maria's window until she finally had to come down to talk to him. He even had the street's resident magician, the amazing Mumford, give a duck Maria's voice so Placido could have Maria and Louise could have the duck. Thankfully, Maria put the operatic diva in his place. The episode was equally hilarious and somewhat uncomfortable. On a related note, one episode had Louise surprised to find Placido, presumably naked, rehearsing a number in Louise and Maria's bathtub. Do people just not lock their doors on Sesame Street? If you're wondering, Placido Domingo did appear on Sesame Street for its 20th anniversary special, where he performed with Placido Flamingo. While they appeared to get along, Domingo recalled years later on Conan O'Brien that the Flamingo actually gave him advice on how to hit certain notes, and didn't exactly have the nicest things to say about him backstage. He was also saying to everybody, it was very funny, because I saw, like, a program before and said, huh, he's coming. I said, and they said, all the, all the rest of them, Mopas said, who is coming? said, ha, the imposter. <laughs> Interestingly, I found a lot of comments in the past of people saying they were afraid of Placido as kids. I can't really figure out why, so if Placido scared you, please let me know in the comments. Whether you found him frightening, entertaining, or you were just indifferent, Placido was retired in 1992 after the passing of Richard Hunt. Most of us will never quite look at a flamingo the same way again. Number 38, Poco Loco, typically performed by Jerry Nelson. Poco Loco was a parrot who appeared from 1974 to 1980 on Sesame Street. He wasn't so much loco as he was crafty, often using his mimicry skills to trick others for fun. There aren't too many sketches of Poco available online, but he appeared to be close friends with Big Bird for his short stay on the show. In his early appearances, he was performed by Jerry Nelson, but in his 1980 appearances, he was performed by Michael Earle. I believe only the Michael Earl clips are viewable online. There. Oh. Wait, this looks a lot like you, Poco. Ah! As a matter of fact, that that is you. What? And that is a silly parrot. That... And you're a silly goose. Oh, I guess I deserve that. In 1993, the puppet was repurposed as H. Ross Parrot, a spoof of the presidential candidate H. Ross Perot, who founded the Reform Party. Perot was all about politics. Parrot, performed by Jerry Nelson, was all about reciting the alphabet. While H. Ross Parrot might not have been presidential material, he knew how to rally the kids to learn their letters. There were apparently no hard feelings from Perot, who said his family loved the character, especially his grandchildren. His only complaint was that the parrot's Texas accent was not authentic enough. The puppet was used one more time as Bolo the Parrot in a 1999 episode. Rosita and Telly attempted to teach him to sing the alphabet song, What is with parrots in the alphabet? But Bolo preferred to sing other songs instead, notably a very nice performance of Joe Raposo's Sing. He had a good voice. So what have we learned? H. Ross Parrot is your bird for the alphabet, Bolo is your bird for singing, and Poco Loco is your bird for messing with people. Take your pick. Number 39, 
The Rockheads, performed by Richard Hunt, Brian Meal, and Martin P. Robinson. The Rockheads are the only characters on the list that I can't find virtually any footage of, but they're so cool looking I had to include them. They were a quartet of rock creatures who lived on an empty lot in Sesame Street, and they looked like a friendlier version of the rock biter from The NeverEnding Story. They taught concepts like subtraction and sorting. The Rockheads made a cameo in the Canadian Sesame Park special Basil Hears a Noise, as creatures in an enchanted forest. Otherwise, we only have a few still frames and pictures of one Rockhead on display at the Center for Puppetry Arts in Georgia. Hopefully more footage of these guys will surface. I am really curious to know more. Number 40. Roosevelt Franklin, voiced by Matt Robinson. I think this is a good character to end this part on. I've gotten a lot of comments hoping that Roosevelt Franklin was going to be on this list, and don't you worry, I don't plan on disappointing you in that department. Out of all the characters featured on this list, Roosevelt probably has one of the most interesting histories, and dates back the farthest. So let's begin all the way back in Season 1. Roosevelt was created and voiced by Matt Robinson, who also played Gordon from Seasons 1-3. to three. In addition, Robinson wrote many of the sketches Roosevelt appeared in, and co-wrote the character's songs with Joe Raposo. In his first two appearances, Roosevelt appeared with his mother, who was voiced by Loretta Long, the actress who played Susan. Mother Franklin would quiz her son on counting, the alphabet, and the days of the week, which Roosevelt would gladly answer in a somewhat cocky, yet endearing fashion. For these few sketches, Matt Robinson gave the character a deep, unchildlike voice before using a higher, softer voice in later sketches. Most of the later sketches were at Roosevelt Franklin Elementary School, which begs the question, was Roosevelt named after the school, or was the school named after him? Roosevelt was often seen teaching his peers about safety, rhyming, respect, and how the continent of Africa was more than just a jungle. According to Muppet Wiki, he was actually sneaking into the classes while the teacher was out, but I couldn't find any real indicator of this when I watched the sketches myself. Roosevelt's classmates were all voiced by other Sesame Street humans, including Sonia Manzano, Maria, as Smart Tina, and Norman Calloway, David, as Baby Breeze. Outside of the elementary sketches, Roosevelt also refereed the game Headball at Roosevelt Franklin Stadium. This was essentially a quiz show disguised as a sport, where players had to answer questions to win. Roosevelt Franklin was a beloved character despite his short time on the show, and even had his own album, The Year of Roosevelt Franklin. He stopped appearing in Season 7, mostly after complaints from various sources. Some viewers wrote to the Sesame Street staff, criticizing the rowdy behavior of the students. Some complained that Roosevelt Franklin acted too black, while others simultaneously complained that he didn't act black enough. Despite Roosevelt leaving the show, he recently made a cameo on Meet the Peets, a reality series based around the life of Holly Robinson Pete, who happens to be Matt Robinson's daughter. In his brief cameo, he was voiced by Chris Knowings, a current regular on Sesame Street. It's all just still Sesame Street. Wait, hold on. Is that Roosevelt Franklin? What? Did somebody call me by my first name first and my second name second? Yes, somebody did. Hi, Roosevelt. Hey, give me a hug. I'll be completely honest. I don't know if I'm fully equipped to talk about the reasons Roosevelt Franklin left in more detail than what I already covered. There are many articles out there online where others give their own two cents, and everyone seems either totally divided or just plain indecisive about how the character is handled. If you're curious, do a Google search and take a look. Even though Roosevelt has mostly left Sesame Street, he's remained in a lot of people's memories and hearts. So he definitely accomplished what he set out to do. Teach. Number 41, Roxy Marie, performed by Fran Brill. Roxy was a smart little girl from Brooklyn with an accent to match. She appeared roughly from 1992 to 1999. A little older than some of the other Muppets, she's in fifth grade, she often appeared in a mentor sort of role to Elmo specifically, who always wanted to help her, despite her insisting that he just get in the way. Roxy's main interest was bugs. She has been seen on Sesame Street trying to train a pet butterfly or searching for the elusive doozy bug often with Elmo right by her side, whether she wanted his help or not. Roxy Marie was Biff's niece, and Biff often tried to bestow his wisdom upon her. Roxy, however, was a bit smarter than Biff and appeared to know it, but she was always nice and patient with her well-meaning uncle. I have to say, watching these Roxy sketches made me realize that if I was a child growing up on Sesame Street, oh, if only, I'd probably have hung out with her a lot. She seemed pretty cool in an endearingly dorky sort of way. Number 42, Ruby, performed by Camille Benora. 
Ruby is a fun little character, and she's kind of like Meryl Sheep from the previous video that I did, in that I didn't know too much about her going in, but found myself charmed very quickly. It's probably no coincidence that they're both performed by Camille Benora, who did a great job with the character. Appearing from the late 80s to the early 90s, Ruby was a creative monster who loved to experiment and see the world in different ways. Our experiment? What experiment? The experiment I just thought of! Her experiments included seeing if she would feel less hungry after eating an imaginary hot dog, and blindfolding herself to experience how the world would be if she were blind. If there was one human Ruby was closest to, it was Gina. Gina often had a big sister role to the Muppets in her early days on Sesame Street, but it was nowhere truer than with Ruby, who greatly admired Gina and wanted to be just like her. Flattered as she was, Gina preferred Ruby to be just the way she was already. I want you to learn this song, okay? And then I want you to sing it. Sing it just like you? No, Ruby, sing it just like you! Oh. Listen. The only time I ever saw Ruby on the show as a kid was in a spoof of Guys and Dolls, which was a nice little song against gender stereotypes about how guys can play with dolls and girls can play with toy trucks. Harry Monster had a doll and Ruby had the truck. It was odd that she took the truck to bed with her at the end, that can't be comfortable, but to each their own. Number 43, Sam the Robot, performed by Jerry Nelson. Also known as Sam the Machine, this super automatic machine first appeared on Sesame Street in 1972, mistakenly thinking he had come to Mulberry Street. When Gordon and Susan tried to tell him he was wrong, he explained that he was a perfect machine, incapable of making mistakes. Sam had a tendency to start skipping like a record, often repeating the same few words again and again, before someone would smack him Fonzie-style and fix him. I've seen this joke used with the Muppets before, and it's a cute gag, but I imagine that it wouldn't last today with kids probably trying it at home in a similar way to Don Music's piano banging. There are only a few Sam sketches online, but there are plenty of descriptions of other scenes on Muppet Wiki, where Sam would often try to learn or mimic a human concept, only to get confused. One sketch that is on YouTube has Sam falling head over heels with Gordon's toaster that Louise is fixing. He learns first about love, and then about heartbreak, when Gordon comes back for the toaster. Okay, wait. Oh, wait! What's wrong? Why are you taking her away? You are already married to Susan. What's with him, man? He's got a crush on your toaster. Hey, hey, Sam, I'm not gonna marry the toaster, man. I'm just gonna take it home and toast my bread, you know? <laughs> come by and visit him when you get ready. How's that? Right. Oh, yes, I'll bring her some pumpernickel. Sam's most interesting appearance wasn't on Sesame Street at all, but rather in a Marvel comic. To backtrack a bit, the Children's Television Workshop had another show, The Electric Company, premiere in 1971, which was aimed at educating a slightly older audience, particularly in reading. In 1974, a segment was introduced called Spidey Super Stories, where Spider-Man would fight new villains and speak only in comic book speech bubbles, encouraging kids to read what he was saying. A comic series was spawned as well, with easier-to-digest stories for kids. A 1978 issue of the comic was called Star Jaws, cashing in on both the then-recent Star Wars and Jaws. In the story, Sam the Machine is hanging out with the Marvel heroine Moondragon, for some reason, when Dr. Victor Von Doom himself appears and captures them. Sam smacks one of the henchmen with his wheel and escapes to Earth to get help from Spidey. Dr. Doom's plan is apparently to use his giant Death Star-looking device to actually eat the Earth. God admire Doom for thinking big. Of course, Spidey and his ragtag band of misfits are able to save the day. Incidentally, on the off chance that James Gunn is watching this, why not add Sam the Robot to the next Guardians of the Galaxy movie? You got Howard the Duck, this shouldn't be that much of a stretch. Sam the Robot stopped appearing around 1979, and unlike other characters where I've just had to speculate that the writers didn't know what to do with them, this time we have actual confirmation from a Norman Stiles interview that this was the reason Sam left. Nonetheless, references to Sam still pop up over the years, including a drawing in a remix video and a CGI character in a Sesame Street Christmas Carol. Technology continues to grow and change quickly today, and Sam was pretty outdated when he first appeared. Still, references to this retro robot will always be appreciated. Number 44, Shelly the Turtle, performed by Martin P. Robinson. Shelly was a shy, slow-moving turtle, as most turtles are. He first appeared in 1986 looking for a home, only to be told by Oscar of all people that he carried his own home, his shell, with him the whole time. 
Other Shelley appearances included him sort of running a marathon, in his own endearing way, and singing the song I Get There, as he slowly makes his way through the world. Shelley's puppet was used twice more as two other turtles, Jiffy and Seymour. Jiffy was a patron at Hooper's store once, who made Shelley look incredibly fast by comparison. His scenes actually remind me a lot of the scenes with the sloths of the DMV from Zootopia. Pam. Pam. Pancakes. Pancakes. Okay, which is it going to be? Eggs or pancakes? Seymour was a turtle who wandered into Big Bird's nest area. Big Bird wanted to keep him as a pet, but he wandered off again, leaving Big Bird more than a little depressed. And like Seymour and so many other Muppets on this list, Shelley also just stopped appearing one day. Well, I don't know if there are a lot of huge Shelley fans out there, he was pretty darn cute. The puppet sometimes gets used for other generic turtles now, but with different voices. Good to see them getting all the mileage they can with that turtle puppet. It's slow, but steady. Number 45, Sherlock Hemlock, performed by Jerry Nelson. This bumbling detective first appeared in 1970, and spent decades attempting to solve mysteries for others, with varying results. Usually, someone would solve the case for him, and he would take the credit. Still, it was hard to be that annoyed Sherlock due to how fun the character was. Sherlock would sometimes be oblivious to the clues in front of him, or he would sometimes suspect the entirely wrong thing. Of course, this was so the kids watching at home could solve the case before him. I think the one case I found that he solved by himself was when he was investigating who stepped on his newspaper. It appeared that none of the culprit's feet matched the footprint until it was revealed that it was Gladys Takao who was to blame. She was wearing tap shoes. Sherlock's ancestor, however, was a bit more competent. In a series of sketches called Caveman Days, Sherlock played the royal smart person who invented things for the king of the cavemen played by Ernie. These inventions included the toothbrush, paper, and an exit sign. Sherlock Hemlock has also had his own recurring sketch called Mysterious Theater, but we'll get to that one a bit later on the list. Sherlock's last speaking cameo on the street came in 2010, when he was waiting at Hooper's store. And who should appear near him but his performer, Jerry Nelson? While he might not be the world's greatest detective that he wanted to be, we'll still always love Sherlock. And when he announces that he solved the case we just saw for him, we'll roll our eyes and politely nod. As always. Number 46. Simon Soundman, performed by Jerry Nelson. Simon's last name wasn't Soundman for no reason. Or was it a nickname? Who knows. He had a gift of mimicry for any sound that a human could not normally make. He's hard to describe in words, so here's a quick clip of him attempting to buy a saw from a tool store. I would like to buy a... <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. A lot of his sketches were set up so the kids watching could guess what Simon was trying to say. In true Sesame Street fashion, it sometimes took the characters a while to figure out exactly what Simon wanted. It was sometimes a little unclear how much Simon could control his unique sound abilities. You would assume it's mostly involuntary, since his manner of speaking often makes things take three times as long. When Ernie imitated him once, he got offended and left in a huff. On the other hand, when Bert expressed admiration and wanted to know how Simon made such wonderful sounds, specifically the sound of a tuba, Simon did try to teach him. If Simon's sound man looks familiar, he was made from the same generic model as Mr. Johnson, Grover's unfortunate customer. One sketch even implied that the two were related, when Simon mentions having a brother who frequents Charlie's restaurant. While Mr. Johnson still appears sometimes today, Simon Soundman just didn't make the... <laughs> Number 47, Sunny Friendly, originally performed by Richard Hunt. People often think of Ernie as being something of a troll to Bert, constantly bothering him and never really giving him peace. However, there have also been countless moments with the duo that show they're best friends for a reason, and Ernie's pestering bird is done from a place of love, if not innocent insensitivity. But if you were to look for the biggest troll on Sesame Street, other than Harvey Kneeslapper, of course, I'd direct you to a certain game show host. Sonny Friendly, the Pat Sajak-style host of countless Sesame Street game shows, was presumably introduced in 1986 in case Jim Henson wasn't able to perform his own host character, Guy Smiley. Henson had become increasingly busy with other projects, and couldn't always be around on Sesame Street. Sonny Friendly took Guy's place for the most part from 1986 to 2000. So where does the trolling part come in? Well, Sonny Friendly may have lived up to his name when it came to how affable he was, 
but his games felt more like he was messing with people for his own amusement, especially when the prizes were handed out. One episode had him host the Sandwich Game, where Telly had to put together a sandwich. The prize? He got to eat the sandwich. Similarly, he once hosted a game called What's Prairie's Problem, where he came out of nowhere one day and asked everyone to guess what was bugging Prairie. In the end, Prairie guessed right. It was Sunny's annoying game show that was bothering her. Her prize was a trip to Sesame Street, where she, of course, already was. Maria usually had it the worst. Once she was duped into playing a few rounds of Sunny's games and was stuck with a nasty consolation prize, a chicken and a sheep that wouldn't leave her alone. Eventually, she played another one of Sunny's games just for a chance to get rid of the prizes. Out of everyone, Maria typically saw through Sunny the most and dreaded whenever he popped up to play another game. When I was on the Sunny Friendly Show, I got water dumped on my head. <laughs> Think that's funny? No. In 1992, after Richard Hunt's passing, Sonny was taken over by David Rudman. Sonny Friendly stopped appearing in 2000, but I have no doubt Maria has had some restless nights, wondering when he'll return with his adoring, invisible audience that may or may not exist. Number 48, Tough Eddie, originally performed by Jerry Nelson. Tough Eddie lived up to his name in the sense that he was definitely tough. But, as Harry Monster taught us, being tough does not equal being a bad guy. In his three appearances, Tough Eddie proved that he had a nicer side underneath his gruff demeanor. I can't find footage of his first appearance, but apparently had to do with him leaving bricks on Oscar's trash can, and Oscar grouchily telling Eddie to move them. Eddie goes to deliver the bricks, but tells Oscar he'll be back later. Suddenly worried for his safety, Oscar asks his friends to wait with him. While Muppet Wiki doesn't detail the thrilling conclusion, I can only guess Eddie was going to apologize. In his next appearance, Tough Eddie accidentally knocked over Bert's sandcastle at the beach, and an overzealous Ernie rushed to Bert's defense. While it looked like Eddie was ready to fight Bert, he instead bought Bert an ice cream cone to apologize. In his final known appearance, Tough Eddie was reformed by Richard Hunt as opposed to Jerry Nelson, and he had to be coaxed by Gordon into letting a new kid play with him and Telly. Tough Eddie was one of those characters who they could have used more of if they were willing to change the formula of his appearances. After all, the punchline to his sketches were pretty much the same, and if they kept using the same setup and gag, then there wouldn't be anything funny about it. Still, I would have liked to see more of this Rough Around the Edges character. He made a nice contrast to the rest of the cast. Number 49. Vincent Twice, Vincent Twice, performed by Martin P. Robinson. Around 1989, a new sketch debuted on Sesame Street called Mysterious Theater. It was a parody of the series Mystery, which also aired on PBS, starting in 1980. In 1981, Vincent Price began hosting the show, and around the time he retired in 89, Vincent twice began spoofing him for the kids, and perhaps also for their parents. Vincent Price most likely didn't mind, as he had acted alongside Kermit and Friends before in an early episode of The Muppet Show. With Mysterious Theater, they went all out in their parody, even spoofing the title sequence by illustrator Edward Gorey. In fact, it wasn't really a spoof, they pretty much just copied a shot of a woman in black casually sipping wine by a gravestone. I was always excited when this came on as a kid, because these sketches were generally moodier and somewhat creepier than your average Sesame Street outing. I found that when I was younger, I liked seeing the show take the occasional darker turn, like in the special Don't Eat the Pictures. Maybe it was just me. Vincent Twice would introduce the stories, where Sherlock Hemlock and his dog Watson would attempt to solve a case, usually set in the UK. Twice himself appeared once in the story itself, having stolen some food. I suppose we really needed him that time. Without him stealing, there'd be no story in the first place. While Vincent Twice didn't last terribly long, he will certainly be missed, spookiness and all. Number 50, Zostik, performed by Joey Mazzarino. We have reached number 50, and he's a villain. A villain on Sesame Street? That's practically unheard of. Well, sure, we've had grouchy characters, mischievous characters, even angry characters, but rarely evil characters. Granted, in some of the movies and specials, there have been flat-out villains, but they are far and between, and most of them are played by human actors. Zostik was the antagonist of a Power Rangers spoof in 1996 called Super Morphin Mega Monsters. From the planet Enormous, he would watch videos of kids playing and send his underlings to cause trouble. Pretty much just because. He would inspire kids to litter, argue over toys, and worst of all, he once had two blue monsters exclude a yellow monster, Mary Monster, because of her different fur color. Inspiring prejudice in children? That's pretty evil. Luckily for Earth, the combined efforts of Elmo Saurus, Zoe Ceratops, Teledactyl, and Rosita Raptor always set things right. 
After a few tries of causing trouble on Earth, Sostig appeared to give up. Perhaps after seeing the Tickle Me Elmo sales records, he realized that these Muppet monsters were juggernauts too big to fight. We'll get them next time. <laughs> Why aren't you laughing? <laughs> Well, that about covers my list of 50 retired Sesame Street Muppets. I'm glad I made it in time for the show's actual anniversary, which is on November 10th. But as promised, here are some runners-up that didn't quite make the list proper, although maybe a few of them should have in hindsight. I had a lot of people asking me about Barkley the Dog, Guy Smiley, and the Amazing Mumford. I'm happy to see so many people love and remember these great characters, but from what I've read on Muppet Wiki, they have appeared somewhat recently, to varying degrees, but more than just cameos. I will also attest that Guy Smiley's Beat the Time sketch with Cookie Monster is probably one of my favorite Sesame Street moments. Then there's Aristotle, a blind monster who liked collecting things and helping others. He only appeared from 1981 to 1983. Bip Bip Badada was a hippie who sang scat-style numbers including the first puppet performance of Manamana. Ferlinghetti Donizetti was a beatnik poet who appeared around the same time, until 1986, to teach kids about rhyming. Mr. Chatterley hosted the show Alphabet Chat, where he attempted to teach kids about certain letters, before the show inevitably devolved into chaos. Irvine the Grouch was Oscar's niece, who appeared mostly from 1979 to 1999. I considered including her with Ernestine and Brad, but in complete honesty, I wasn't a huge fan of this character, so I chose to omit her. On that note, Oscar's girlfriend Grungetta was brought up a few times, but she's actually been on the show somewhat recently as well. She taught me that grouch romance is a confusing thing indeed. There was a little monster girl named Lulu who a few people mentioned. She appeared mostly in the early 2000s and was often hesitant to try something new. She's probably most notable for having three distinct character designs over the span of only three or four years. Wolfgang the Seal almost made the list but I think he had a somewhat major appearance just recently enough that he didn't quite meet the criteria. Which is too bad, because I love seals. I got a few asks about a mysterious character named Limbo, also known as Face or Nobody, who counted to 10 in a trippy little segment. And while he does have a cool background appearing in some old Jim Henson routines, he didn't appear enough on Sesame Street to count for my list. Kermit the Frog got brought up in the comments a lot, which I understand, but I wanted to focus on characters people wouldn't necessarily know much about. Kermit is arguably the most famous, well-known Muppet there is, barring Miss Piggy, of course, and while it's true that he's technically a retired Sesame Street character due to copyright issues, I didn't think he really needed to be on this list. If your favorite character didn't make this list, I'm sorry. It wasn't really a countdown, anyway. I wasn't ranking them or anything. I hope that even if you think I missed some good characters, you are able to enjoy this video and have fun reminiscing about classic Sesame Street. As I said in the first part, even if Sesame Street isn't really like it was when we were kids, the fact that it's still going today, still teaching kids important lessons, teaching them to be potentially better people than some adults in today's society, well that's an admirable thing indeed. Happy 50th birthday, Sesame Street.